There's a number of items that I have in my collection which I consider to be exceptionally special. I don't have a whole lot of them, and they're very difficult to categorize into any one thing. It's also not a guarantee that they're a computer or electronic, but more often than not they are. This is one such example I have in this little envelope here. This is called the Mimic 1. It is an embedded computer, it's 8080A based, it has a little bit of RAM, and it has, what are these? Yes, three Intel 1702 EEPROMs. This is not S100. It's its own little thing. This isn't a microcomputer per se. It is just simply a single board computer from the very, very, very early days. And I don't just have the board. No, 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 no. I have the full documentation. And in a very, very fragile copy, I even have the full schematics for this computer. Stuff like this you never see anymore. Uh, these are very early. Um, you would almost call it homebrew. It's a hand routed board, but it's in such beautiful condition and it's, well, so, so, so well kept with all the documentation. I keep it in a special part of the collection and I try very hard to make sure that it doesn't get damaged. This is another item which I consider to be exceptionally special. This is what we would call a homebrew computer. What does that mean? This wasn't off the shelf, though the components inside of this computer may very well be off the shelf. Everything you see here is custom done. This here was purchased at a value village in West Vancouver about two years ago now. I don't know who originally built this. If you're watching this by chance, or you know who made this, did a very good job. This thing is absolutely fantastic. But the homebrew computer world meant that you could customize it and build it whichever way you want. You know how some people customize their PC cases now? Kind of the same thing. So we have this case here, which if you look on the sides, has these wood panels, real wood, beveled edges. On the top, we have this two-piece folded metal lid and they've cut the openings for this keyboard here and this keyboard here is not for any one computer it's for a Videc word processing terminal that I can tell this was from their fourth generation of electronic word processors and when Exxon bought them out or you know that Exxon and proceeded to shut them down not that long after because the market of electronic word processors pretty much cratered uh, these were being liquidated, and someone wanted it for the computer. So, here it is, a Videc keyboard built into this custom computer. And there is this fancy red button here. That is a reset button. If we look at the back of this machine here, they also spent the time to put these vent holes into the sheet metal. They also cut and punched holes in the bottom here as well, and everything's got these fantastic angles on it. It didn't just go into the box pan break. Someone thought this through. And they wanted it to look nice. And it does look absolutely fantastic. It doesn't, however, have screws. The one complaint I have is that the whole top portion of this here just comes off. There is no retaining screws or anything like that. Another thing that's a trademark of a homebrew computer is that everything was pretty much rolled themselves. Uh, the hardware, the enclosure, even the power supply. And that could be wire wrapping a board. It could very well be photo etching your own circuit boards, designing it, something like that. It doesn't really adhere to any given standard or clone of any other computer design. So when I take the lid off of this, it's going to look a little strange. There we go. And by the way, this one ribbon cable right here, this is actually the connector for the keyboard. It kind of got a little broken up when I found it at Value Village, so I'm still trying to reverse engineer exactly how it's supposed to reconnect to the keyboard. But we'll get to that. So inside the computer here, we have what looks like an S100 backplane, but it's not an S100 backplane. We have this adorable little linear power supply over here. The only changes I've made to this personally is that I added a fuse, I added a... Uh, internally uh, noise reducing IEC power connector instead of just a cable that was pigtailed out the back and I added a physical power switch. 
The rest of it here is just this beautiful linear power supply, transformer, big blue cap, bridge rectifier, and your initial regulation here. There's more regulation here. The back plane is isolated from the case using just strips of wood that have been drilled through. And it's worth pointing out, they've marked all of these. These are all beautifully centered. This is absolutely fantastic. It looks great. It really, really does. But they were designing it for something here. And even though they've etched this um, back plane with a whole bunch of other connector slots, they haven't actually used them. Um, and I don't know what interface standard this is. They could have very well rolled their own here. It's not like Benton Harbor. It's not S100. It's not that one interface that the SWT PC used. It was just something weirder than that. And everything about this is weird. So let me take out one of the two boards that are in here, which seem to be the only two boards that were ever in this. So I'll pull this out. This here is the main CPU board. Um, it is a hand drawn board. It has been photo etched double sided with lots of vias drilled through it. Um, looks very clean. You have your vertical arrangement here, horizontal arrangement in the back. Very well thought out. We have our interface here for the keyboard. We have an RCA CDP 1851. I forget what that is. Um, a Motorola MC 14515 here. We have two intercell Intersil, sorry, uh, D2114 uh, SRAM chips. We have two sockets right here for ROM. Um, was this a 27? Yes. This here is a single 2716. I'll talk about what's on that EEPROM in a little bit here. And then finally, the CPU itself. So this isn't a Z80. This isn't a 6502. Um, this isn't even a 6800 or an Intel. This is something far weirder that I've never really gotten to play with because it's such a weird CPU that wasn't all that popular. This machine is built for the RCA 1802 microprocessor, the Cosmac. Now, RCA had their own computer for this, the VIP. Uh, Netronix had the ELF and the ELF 2, and there was a couple other smaller computers like the COMX35 that used the 1802. The reality is the 1802 was a microprocessor that was designed and struggling to find itself a market that it was to be used in. This saw its use in game machines. Um, I forget the name of that one RCA game console. Um, it was used in arcade machines, wasn't really successful. It was used in home computers, obviously. It did finally find its home market in embedded uses, notably uh, embedded communications devices such as satellites and interstellar spacecraft, which is kind of a neat departure. That's a really unique CPU. But nonetheless, here is the color machine as it calls itself. This is its main board. And that just plugs in to the furthest most slot right here. This board right here is the video board. There's no other IO on this, which is Bizarre, but okay. Carefully pull this out of here. So, this here has its own Intersil uh, SRAM. It actually has like three times as much memory here on the video board than it has anywhere else. It has expansion for more if you want on it. Uh, this also uses a considerable number of RCA ICs. The rest of them are Motorola, pretty much. Uh, and then we have our video chip set over here. This is the MC6847. If I remember, that's the same video chipset used in Tandy's color computer. I could be wrong here. Um, next to that, we have a CDP1852. And we have hiding way up over here, the MC1372. So the way this works is that typically when I deal with microcomputers, I'm dealing with a composite video signal somewhere that's coming out of the computer. This is a little bit different. This color machine um, and its video board actually outputs on RF, and that's coming from the CRTC to that um, 1372, and then it comes straight out. There's a, uh, an F-type coaxial connector right there. This board is made just as beautifully as the CPU board, looks absolutely fantastic. And I do like how they put the F-type connector right there. And that plugged on the, into the far end of the board right here. 
Like I said before, there's a little bit of regulation going on here. The back side of this board, I'm just going to put an inset of the photograph so you can see what it looks like here. There's a couple of wires that are just kind of connecting to the bus and they're running off to this board right here. Now, I was a little confused about what on earth this was and then I thought about it and then I looked at the pinout which is actually printed onto the circuit board when this was etched and then I realized, wait a minute, this edge connector, that pinout, there's only one thing that can go to. This is Commodore's C2N dataset drive. Um, for the Commodore 64, the PET, the VIC-20, it was a very popular cassette deck that was used by Commodore and it came out a, a bunch of different iterations. And I can't help but notice this connector right here. Yeah, the keen is the exactly the same. The pinout is exactly the same. It just plugs in, goes through the hole in the back of the machine, and there is your data storage and your data retrieval system. There is no floppy controller on this. Uh, there's no serial ports on this either. So whatever software was coming into this thing had to go through the C2N as the cassette port. And that was all built into this right here. Now, as for running the machine, this is where things get a little bit more interesting because I also can't describe too much what's going on. But what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna quickly throw the lid on. I'm gonna grab a nice matching TV for this thing and I'm gonna get some power and we're gonna turn this on and I'll show you what it does and then explain a little bit more from there. So here we are now all set up. We have this beautiful RCA portable color television set plugged in using the RF to the computer. The computer also has attached to it the Commodore data set. So this is probably how it looked when it was still in use. Some of the date codes on this machine, by the way, dated to about mm, 1982, 1981, right around that time period there. This is definitely not Apple One era stuff, but let's just say that this is probably more performing than the Apple One would have ever have been. Anyways, I digress. What I'm gonna do here is I'm going to turn on our TV, and I'm gonna give that there a moment to warm up. And then, so you would come here, you would sit down, and then you would flip the switch, and you'd be rewarded with this. Now, what is MacBug? Well, I'm not really sure myself, but I'm assuming it's just shorthanding for machine debugger. Um, the ROM that is in here, that one EEPROM, is in fact mostly full of routines just to get it to the screen you see here. It programs a display, gives you a very basic console, says MacBug, and contains a little bit of code which allows you to then use the cassette for reading and writing. My guess here is that you power the machine on. If you want to do stuff in machine language, now you can do that. But if you wanted to load a basic interpreter that's for the 1802, well, you could just grab yourself your cassette and just put that into the cassette there, hit play, and off you went once it loaded, and there you go. Or, because there is no like immediately available or marketed copy of BASIC for the 1802 that I'm aware of, unless we're using the BASIC that was available for the RCA VIP or the Medtronic's ELF, you would have a mailing list that you would be involved in, and you would get something like this. This is just a mail carrier for a piece of cassette software. And so I'll take that out. There's your game. There's your documentation on how to use said game and how to load said game. So you'd turn the machine on, you'd be at this prompt here, and then you could just put the cassette in, um, load by the cassette, hit play, and it's either gonna be written in machine language, language and you're talking to the bare metal on the CPU and the RAM, or you first had to load your basic interpreter then you could load your basic game on cassette. And that's how it works. Or at least, that's how I speculate it works. You see, the reality is, I don't know how it works. I've gone through all of the 1802 mailing lists. I've looked at some of the variations that existed of the 1802 for CPUs in microcomputers. And I can't really find anything that is similar to how this is set up. I don't find board layouts for etching. Uh, I can't find any reference to MacBug. I can't find 
anything that makes reference to how the system is configured up in this weird way. Um, that's why I'm assuming that whoever made this rolled their own computer. It's a homebrew. They made the case. They made the tape interface. They made the backplane. They made the computer's main board. They made the video board. And even though they are very nicely laid out boards, my assumption here, my guess, is that because everything else here looks so beautiful, they were an engineer by trade. And this was just a spare time in the workshop to use the board etch and the box pad break. And this was something they built for like the spare room in their house. And they used this for a couple of years and then moved on from there. Honestly, I don't know. And that's why I'm asking you, faces and people of YouTube, to help me with this. I would love to find more information about what design this computer was based off of. I would love to know, like, is this more ELF oriented or is it more to the RCA specification? I really don't know. Perhaps you owned an RCA 1802 machine yourself. They weren't common, but there is still a community out there. I'd like to hear from you. And I have seen some of the mailing lists and I've gone back through decades of information that's on there. There's a lot of cool programs. I wouldn't necessarily say a killer app, but with hardware like this, could you really blame it? Anyways, this is my mysterious RTA, RCA 1802 based microcomputer that is completely homebrew. I really hope you like this machine. I really like this machine. And it's a fantastic exemption to what I say is not really all that great. This is amazing in every way and manner. And I hope you liked it. And until next time, have a good one. Thank you.